All right, a um, couple more solutions for physics so far. This video, I believe, where is it? There we go. We'll have uh, the solutions for 9 and 10. We'll see how that goes. Um, in number 9, we have a small block. Mass half a kilogram released from here. That's 2 meters. Uh, the radius of this loop is half a meter, so that's one meter total. And uh, this height here is three tenths of a meter, and the angle is 37 degrees. And we're ignoring friction here. Um, all right, so find the speed of the block at the top of the circular section of the ramp. So um, anytime we have a situation where an object is going from a higher position to a lower position, or changing relative to a spring, something like that, um, hopefully that puts us in mind of energy. So I'm going from this height to this height. And that's all I care about right now. So um, if I take this to be height zero for this part of the problem, then the block going from here to here, it doesn't matter that it's going through the loop from here to here, since there's no friction, no energy will be lost, then the gravitational potential here will turn into kinetic energy here, right? So I have one meter's worth dropping from here to here. Of course, it'll be going faster here, right? Then it would have all two meters worth, but then it's gonna go back up and lose that, so. All right, so that looks like Uh, the gravitational potential energy at the top is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at the top of the circle, or the loop, I should call it, right? So that's going to be here, mgh equals one-half mv squared. Cancel, and we've come up with a similar expression We've seen this a bunch of times before. If we have a pure transfer of gravitational potential to kinetic energy, then that is the uh, equation that keeps coming up. You can't just drop that out of nowhere, though. You have to show your uh, derivation of that. So the velocity at the top of the loop will be equal to 2, sorry, the square root of 2 times 9.8 times 1 meter. So square root 2 times 9.8, that's about 4.43 meters per second. And you'd call that 4.4 would be fine. Okay, that was easy. Um, find the normal force on the block when it's at the top of the circular section of the ramp. Okay. When it's at the top of the circular section of ramp, the forces on it are the gravitational force, of course, and the normal force. And since it's um, upside down, the ramp pushing on it is also down. I'm going to make that look different. I'm not really sure if it's bigger or smaller than the gravitational force at this point. But for the purposes of drawing a diagram, I'm going to draw it like that for now. And I also know, since the uh, puck, uh, sorry, block is moving in a circle, that the sum of all forces acting on that block must be a force toward the center of the circle, which is the sum of those two in this case. And that must be equal to the centripetal force formula that we know for that, mv squared over r. So that's how this calculation is going to play out. So that's mg plus the normal force is equal to mv squared over r. So the normal force is equal to, I'll start plugging in values now, half a kilogram times 4.43 meters per second squared divided by the radius of the loop is half a meter minus 
9.5 times 9.8. And for the purposes of calculation, those cancel out. And we end up with 4.43 squared minus half of a 9.8. Sorry, I'm embarrassed. I just put that in the calculator. That's 4.9. Uh, so it's about 14.7 newtons. Fourteen point seven newtons of normal force, and the gravitational force is uh, so my diagram is actually pretty okay. The gravitational force would be four point nine newtons. Cool. Um, part C. What's the speed at the bottom of the circular ring? So it looks like C and D. We're just going to uh, repeat what we did in A and B, but now we're at the bottom of the ramp. So same thing. We have gravitational energy at the top of the ramp to the kinetic energy at the bottom of the loop. So mgh might be equal to 1 half mv squared. You get the same thing, that the velocity is equal to the square root of 2 mgh, but this time vh is equal to 2, because two, it's dropped to the full 2 meters now. So, the square root of 4 times 9.8, 6.26. It's going faster at the bottom. That should not be a surprise. Should have been a surprise if you got something uh, smaller. It would cause you to go back and check your work, I hope. All right. Now at the bottom of the ramp, the forces acting on the block are the gravitational force and the normal force, which is now up. And since this puck is moving on a circular ramp, the sum of all forces must be unbalanced toward the middle of the circle, which would be up. So I know that that's bigger. So it'd be normal force minus gravitational force. And in the case where something is moving in a circular path, that unbalanced force is equal to mv squared over r. So my normal force is equal to, let's do this again. So we've got mv squared, it's a new velocity at the bottom of the ramp now, over r plus the gravitational force, adding that over to here, m g. So that's still 4.9. So this time I have 6.26 squared plus 4.9, which is about 44.1 newtons. And if you've ever been on a roller coaster, the disparity between those two values should make sense should um, agree with your experience. That, uh, that's where you're going to feel that that's like the, this point at the bottom, that's like that first big turn in the uh, Intimidator, right? Where you first go around a big turn at high speed. Um, and then last, when the block leaves the ramp, it flies off as a projectile. We want to find the maximum horizontal range and maximum height. So, projectile motion. Uh, first thing we need to do is figure out how fast it's going to be going when it leaves the ramp. So once again, I'm going to have gravitational energy turning into kinetic energy. So I'm going to end up with the same V equals the square root of 2GH. But this time, we're going to have the square root of 2 times 9.8 times the difference in height from here to here, since this is 0.3 meters, the difference from here to here is 1.7. So it's going to pick up 1.7 worth. That'll give us our launch velocity. And bigger or smaller than 6.26. 
Yep, you knew it would be smaller, a little bit. 5.77 meters per second. And that's going to be launched at 37 degrees. So, time to do some kinematics. So the vertical part of the problem, horizontal part of the problem, um, I will do the horizontal range first. So, let's see, I've got to find my, my initial velocity here, and my horizontal constant velocity here will be the sine and cosine components of this. So, 5.77, sure I'm in degree mode, which I was not, times the cosine will give us the horizontal. And 1.77 times the sine of 37 degrees will give us the vertical. Right. And what else do we know? I know that the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And I know that it's by the time, like from the launch position, to the ground, it's going to go down 0.3 meters, right? Because the launch height was 0.3 meters above the ground. And now I need to find the time here. I can bring that over here and find the range. So I'm going to use delta y is equal to 1 half at squared plus vit. And it looks like this is going to be our full-blown quadratic. So I am going to have to use me calculator here. And graph that. So let's see, I got negative 4.9x squared plus 3.47x plus 0.3, because I'm adding that over to the other side. And before I go hitting graph, I'm going to go to my window. Um, X min and X max, that's the time value. So is it going to hit before one second? I don't know. I'm going to go to five seconds just to be safe. Um, and then it's not going below zero and probably not going above 10 meters. So that's probably fairly decent. Oh, look at that. Bloop. A little tiny thing there. Um, so let's find, and you know what? Since I'm looking for the zero here, I'm going to go back and just make that y min, let's say, just so I can see a cross, right? So I can, it looks like it crosses in between zero and one. It's not even up there for a second. So second, calculate the zero, which is between zero and one, but it's definitely between zero and five. That's what I graphed, so. You could have typed in zero and one there. Um, 0.786 seconds. So that's the same time here. So my delta x is the product of those because it's constant velocity, right? How far did you go? Well, how fast times how long? 0 0.461 times 0 0.786. So it looks like it goes about 3.62 meters. Sorry, that's a little bit off the screen there. That's 3.62 meters. And then the other part of part E is the maximum height reached by the block. So I just have to kind of reset this here. Another vertical problem. The initial vertical velocity is still 3.47 meters per second. The acceleration is still negative g. Uh, now I know that the final velocity is equal to uh, zero at the top, right? And I would like to know how much the position changes, right? So what is the equation that relates those? So that's the vf squared equals vi squared plus 2a delta y. The f is 0, 
So 3.47 squared plus 2 times negative 9.8 times delta y. So solving that for delta y, we get point six one four meters. Now um, you might be tempted to just throw that down as your answer, but um, that's the delta y and it started at the launch, it was already 0.3 meters up. So the, I know you have to think, it's, it's horrible, I know. And uh, always thinking, right? Not just plugging numbers in. Uh, the max height is equal to the launch height, 0.3 plus the delta Y. So 0.914 meters is the maximum height that it reaches. Right. So that was a good problem. Lots of good stuff in there. Let's do number 10. Where is it? There it is. Okay, so number 10, we have a potential energy curve. And maybe just remind you here that when we see this kind of curve, um, this is not like the path that a particle takes. This tells us how much potential energy it has at different positions. Um, what we do know is that one way of understanding this is that if you, it's almost like this was like a uh, kind of a ramp or a track. So if you released a marble here, what would it do? It would go this way. What would it do if you released it right here? It would stay there. If you released it right here, well, if you could balance it just perfectly there, it would stay, right? It might go this way or that way if you nudged it, but um, we know that uh, that's one way of understanding this. So if it's here, there would be a force on it in this direction. If it's here, there'd be a force in this direction. And in fact, the amount of force at any given position is equal to the derivative of this except with a negative sign, right? It's the opposite direction. Um, and you can think about, if you think about forces, the force of gravity and potential energy associated with gravity, this is mg times position. The derivative of that would be mg, right? So the force is negative mg. The potential energy stored in a spring is 1 half kx squared. The derivative of that would be kx and then you throw a negative sign on there. So this is, uh, I'm sorry, I should put a little there. That's spring, right? So that's a couple ways of remembering this relationship um, and making sense of it. All right, so let's see if we can make sense of this problem. So A, identify all points of equilibrium where there's zero net force for this particle. We just talked about that. Those are the places where uh, the slope would be zero. Right? And you can think about that marble thing too. Right? So that would be at 2 meters and 5 meters. And at 5 meters. And they didn't say to justify, but I'm just going to, just to reinforce that. That's because the derivative with respect to position of our potential energy function is 0. And that's equal to force. So that's where the force is zero. Um, in part B, suppose the particle has a constant total energy, so its total mechanical energy is four joules, as shown by the dashed line. So this is the total energy. Then how much kinetic energy does it have at the following positions? Um, the only thing I don't like about this question is if they had given us a mass and then maybe asked how fast is it going, What's the speed at those positions? That might have been a little bit better question. Um, would involve a little bit more work. This is actually a really easy question, right? If the total energy is 4 joules, well, at 2 meters, it has 1 joule of potential energy. So the rest of it has to be kinetic energy, right? So 
since the total mechanical energy is equal to 4 joules, we have uh, number 1 here at 2 meters, kinetic energy would be equal to 3 joules, right? So the total would be 4, and when it's at 4 meters, looks like the potential energy is 3 joules, so the kinetic would have to be the remaining 1. So at 4 meters, kinetic energy is equal to 1 joule. That's certainly very easy if you understand what's going on here. Um, can the particle reach the position 0.5 meters? Well, if it has a total energy of 4 joules, the position uh, 0.5 meters is right here. Now, 0.5 meters, it would have 6 joules of um, potential energy. And there's not 6 joules available, right? There's only 4 total. So, C, no. Um, and if we wanted to explain um, the potential energy at 0.5 meters is equal to 6 joules, and there's only... 4 joules of mechanical energy. So we can't do that. And then D, can it reach the position at 5 meters? And it looks like yes. Because the potential energy at 5 meters, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely, they've made it clear to us that it's less than 4 joules. So we can do it. And the last part here, on the grid above, carefully draw a graph of the conservative force acting on the particle as a function of x from 0 to 7 meters. And we talked about already this relationship, that it's the negative slope. So that's how we're going to do it. Uh, first of all, I'm going to plot those points where it's 0. It's 0 at 2 meters and it's 0 at 5 meters. Now here, it looks like it's got a pretty, it's very straight up until about one and a half or so. So um, what's the slope here? It looks like it's uh, rise over run would be, it drops 4 and goes over 1, so it would be a slope of negative 4. So it has a constant slope, oops, the slope's negative 4, but the force is the opposite of that, right? So it would be positive 4, right? And if you want to make sense of this with that marble example again, if you release the marble from here, it would go this way. It would go in the positive direction, right? So there must be a positive force acting on it. Um, and then it's got to get down to here in a hurry. And then it's going to turn around, and then through here, it looks like it's pretty straight, and it's got a slope here of, looks like just one, right? Rise over run would just be one. So that means the force is negative one. And that's from a little bit after two to a little bit before five. Right? And then the last, it looks like it's got a slope of maybe negative two, so that means our force is positive two. I'll leave a little bit of room to make that transition. Now, it's not piecewise linear. In other words, these are not sharp corners. So it doesn't just go chunk, chunk. It does curve through. So I'm just going to do my best to connect those like this, right? And those would be the the very rapidly changing slope at those curvy bits. So something like that. Wait, and I leave it to you to determine if I did that carefully enough or not. I think I did.